Well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is John Finney. I'm an independent MSP for the Highlands and Islands, and it's my pleasure to welcome you along on this significant day for human rights, not just in Scotland, with the launch of the Scotland's National Action Plan, but also uh, around the globe. Yeah, I don't intend to say much. I hope I'm not in bother with the Rhodes Union for doing that. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, who will take you on from here. Well, thanks very much uh, to you, John, not just for this evening, but for all the support you and, and everyone in the cross-party group has given towards this journey towards launching um, Scotland's first national action plan for human rights, which was successfully uh, launched uh, today. Um, but we're also very lucky to have with us, um, and I'd be very pleased to introduce him to you very shortly, um, a very welcome visitor from the Council of Europe, the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, Niels Musnix. Uh, who's been with us all day helping mark uh, this, this occasion. Um, we also have um, a number of MSPs um, who have come from the debate that was held in the chamber uh, earlier today uh, on a, a resolution um, which was unanimously passed um, supporting uh, Scotland's first national action plan for human rights. So cross-party support uh, and we're very pleased to have here a sort of cross-party representation with uh, Alice McInnes, uh, Lib Dems. We have, um, I think, Patrick Harvey uh, is here, and I saw Jenny Mara uh, earlier. Um, and there might be more that are coming down from the chamber. And apologies from Alison Johnson. And apologies from, Urquhart. from Alison Johnson and, and Jean Urquhart. Um, so I don't want to... Um, say very much more because there is an animation here which says it much better than any of us could from the Commission about uh, what is Scotland's first national action plan for human rights. So I would like to um, share that with you, uh, then uh, invite Niels and, and uh, those representatives from the, the political parties to give their views um, on today and then open it up for, for discussion, questions, comments, uh, whatever. And, uh, Without any further ado, uh, we'll uh, play the animation. We all know what human rights are, right? It's about fairness. Or is it freedom? Or was it justice? Truth is, it's all these things and more. You see, back in 1948, the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A collection of 30 articles which set down what every individual and every society should recognise and respect, so we are all treated in the way we are all entitled to. Because human rights don't just apply to people on the other side of the world. Human rights belong to all of us in Scotland. You, me, your family, your friends, everyone. That's because human rights impact on our day-to-day -day lives, at home, at work, in schools, on the street, everywhere we go. And while Scotland has a pretty good track record of human rights in terms of law and policy making, this isn't always true of our everyday experiences. Unfortunately, many people in Scotland are unaware of how human rights are relevant to them. Everyone should be treated with dignity, whether they're in a care home or their own home. Everyone should be respected for who they are and be able to be everything they can be and no one should have to choose between feeding their family or heating their home. That's what SNAP is about, Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. Over the past four years, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has worked to understand how much people can realise their human rights. As well as gathering lots of evidence, the Commission has brought together organisations from across the country to develop a roadmap for human rights. And now the real journey begins. This will mean that we can all participate in the decisions that affect our lives and the communities we live in. Through SNAP, the government, local authorities, as well as services such as the NHS, voluntary organisations, and even businesses can focus more on their human rights responsibilities. SNAP will help them look at ways to respect, protect, and fulfil human rights in everything they do. SNAP shows Scotland's ambition to be an example of how to realise human rights and tackle injustice at home and abroad. Everyone can get involved in SNAP and everyone can benefit from it. For a better culture, better lives and a better world. And who can say fairer than that, right?
Well, um, thanks very much for um, listening to that. Um, I would now like to um, introduce to you um, Niels Musnix, who's the uh, Human Rights Commissioner from the Council of Europe. Um, the National Action Plan uh, has followed uh, best practice internationally in terms of how to develop a plan, uh, and we're very appreciative of the support we've had from uh, Niels and his colleagues in the Council of Europe, uh, as well as from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, at the UN. Um, but in order to get a, a, a sort of perspective of the significance of the National Action Plan, which uh, we have now on our website and in the document uh, that we have here, uh, I'm going to invite Niels to give his take of what his, um, his views of it are and, and also perhaps share some of the perspectives he's had from being with us uh, from very early this morning and indeed uh, uh, last night. So, Niels, uh, very welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's been, a, it's been a great day, a very intense day, and a number of you I've seen in several events today, so I will try not to repeat myself so you do not have to listen to the same message over and over again. Uh, but there are certain things, I think, that bear repeating. Um, but I want to start with the, uh, by first of all, welcoming the adoption of the action plan as, as, a, as a, an excellent step forward at, for human rights in Scotland, uh, but also in Europe. This is part of a broader trend in Europe, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I was particularly pleased today to hear in the, in the parliament, uh, member after member of the parliament from different political groups express support for human rights, express support for the plan. Um, I think this is excellent. Uh, it shows that this is an issue that unites people, uh, that everybody sees that they stand to gain politically, uh, that everybody stands uh, to gain personally uh, from uh, enshrining human rights as a core element of policy. And I think that's, that's excellent. I think that's a key uh, key to maintain this success, uh, key to maintain this support to have success in the future. Because I think that parliaments actually have a, an absolutely essential role um, in claiming ownership of human rights plans, uh, allocating sufficient money so that the plans can be implemented, um, and taking them into account when devising uh, not only policies that affect civil and political rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, and I think that human rights and equality impact assessments can gauge the impacts of the various austerity measures that many uh, countries are having to, to, to go through. Uh, and I think it's absolutely essential to, take, to pay special attention to, to the situation of, of vulnerable groups. And this is something that is uh, central to, to the action plan. Uh, I'm pleased also that the Scottish Parliament has benefited uh, until now from the independent advice of the Scottish Human Rights Commission in economic decision making, uh, in various other uh, areas. Uh, and I think it's absolutely essential to ensure that minimum core levels of social and economic rights are, are guaranteed uh, for all at all times. Um, despite the economic crisis, the difficulties uh, that the European human rights system is facing, uh, you are part of a broader movement to try to do more systematic work for human rights. Um, today, the Netherlands launched a human rights action plan as well. Uh, there are a number of countries that are uh, doing excellent work in this, in this field, Finland, Moldova. Uh, there are a number of countries right now that are planning uh, to adopt human rights action plans. My predecessor, Thomas Hammerberg, is in Georgia uh, advising the Georgian government on creating a national human rights action plan. The Armenian government, the Turkish government are all discussing uh, similar initiatives. Uh, so there's quite a bit of movement in Europe now. Uh, and I think that this is an excellent thing for human rights, uh, and I think that you uh, can, can, can basically help others through your good experience um, in drafting the plan. I, I've seen things in Scotland, I've heard things in Scotland, I think that could be of great benefit to others uh, going down a similar path. Um, I think, first of all, the, uh, you know, the baseline study that started the whole process, the fact that you relied on evidence and not on kind of, one political parties, governments, or ministries uh, 
vision of what's going on, but that you actually used science and, 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 and research. Um, I think the, the fact that you had so many different groups, stakeholder groups participating, uh, and especially the parliament, I think that's absolutely essential to have the parliament involved as well, uh, and to get them informed, engaged, uh, to have ownership, and to bring specific issues. I heard a number of uh, different parliamentarians want to add things to the plan. That's great. Uh, that you want to add things and make the plan more inclusive, to make the plan uh, uh, cover all of the human rights issues of concern. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's excellent, that there is this desire. Um, I think that raising awareness among all groups as, as a part of, the, uh, part of the plan is absolutely essential. In some other good plans I've seen, somehow this has been forgotten, or that this need to raise awareness is an ongoing uh, requirement, uh, not only among the public at large, but among civil servants, different professional groups. <clears throat> I think the fact that you've tried to link it up to European and international standards and monitoring is a good practice. One thing which you have done, which I have not seen elsewhere as well, is try to integrate business and human rights to involve the business community. Uh, I think this is, this is also excellent and very, very progressive. And the fact that you are uh, going international through the Commonwealth Games, but trying to integrate human rights concerns into a big sports event uh, next year. I think that is also excellent. I think that we, uh, this needs to be, this, such an approach needs to be spread to other countries, organi organizing the Olympics, organizing other big sports events. Um, so I think that, uh, as we've been saying all day long, now the hard work begins. I think for Parliament, of course, this means making sure that the action plan has sufficient resources to be carried out. Uh, <clears throat> that the broad support that it enjoys now is maintained over time uh, and that it actually leads to concrete results improving the lives of people. So I commend you on the excellent work you've done uh, until now and I look forward very much to, to, to watching you and helping in any way I can to make sure that uh, your efforts bear, bear more fru fruit in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Niels. Um, it, it's not exactly as bulky as the white paper, but <laughs> it, it does have a lot of reading um, to do. And uh, what I would very much like, John, if it's possible, is that you know, maybe the next meeting of the cross-party group, we could have a more you know, reflectful, considered um, discussion about the action plan and uh, what potential roles that you may um, see as being something that could be played in its implementation. But just to say one or two things uh, about it before I introduce Tressa Burke, who was one of the members of the Advisory Council, which sort of oversaw the development of the action plan, is that um, today's the beginning of a process, uh, as, as Niels has said. It's not a, a one-off event. Uh, what we learned through the Advisory Council, which was about 25 people from the breadth of civic society, um, bringing their experience to sort of overseeing the process of shaping SNAP, and also the drafting group, which was made up of 12 different organisations ranging from Amnesty to the Scottish Government and many bodies in between, is that this is not a traditional action plan with either a, a wish list from below or a tick list from above. It, it is a, the beginning of a process um, of a shared commitment of the government, the parliament, public sector, voluntary sector, uh, business uh, and individuals uh, for a transformative program of action to actually change culture, um, to increase empowerment, to increase accountability, to increase the, the know-how of public bodies to operationalize human rights and, and meet the responsibilities. Um, it's followed best practice in the sense it was based on evidence that was gathered um, over four years by the, the Human Rights Commission and with a lot of participation from, from several of you uh, who are here, uh, then inclusively developed uh, and shaped by the drafting group and, and a broad participative process. And it will then next be implemented through that same shared commitment uh, there'll be human rights action groups put together in the specific areas of the action plan um, to further identify and take the steps required to um, fill 
those areas that need to be more explicitly addressed uh, to integrate human rights into the decision-making process. Um, there will be annual reports to Parliament. Uh, there will be an annual uh, national human rights interaction on December 10th where rights holders will be able to share what experience they've had over that past year and hold to account to those who have made commitments. Um, so it's very much a process in which a human rights-based approach, that is getting those in authority around the table with those whose rights are being impacted to agree the actions that need to be taken within a human rights framework. Some of the early examples that show the potential of it have already been identified and commitments made, for example, to embed human rights and the right to human dignity in the integration of health and social care. Uh, a commitment to hold an innovation forum to examine how uh, other countries and how international human rights law should better be uh, reflected in how to deal with austerity and to reprioritize the way in which uh, the state uh, allocates the available resources and prioritizes those who are the most vulnerable rather than doing it upside down, which is what the way it has been in the UK to date. Internationally, it will mean that Scotland plays um, an increasingly engaged role uh, as part of the uh, making a better world. So championing climate justice, uh, having a, a plan to implement the UN guiding principles in business and human rights that Scottish companies operating abroad uh, know how to meet their human rights responsibilities and can be held to account. And it's also created a momentum. Um, you know, things that aren't actually formally in SNAP are now being spurred on. For example, uh, today, the organizing committee of the 2014 Commonwealth Games uh, have published uh, a human rights statement which acknowledges their responsibilities to ensure that all aspects of the Commonwealth Games are human rights compliant. That can range from um, you know, procurement and, and supply chain, to ensuring that trafficking uh, does not take place, to ensuring that those who want to make peaceful protests um, are enabled um, to do so. And that's the first time that the Commonwealth Games uh, since 1930 has um, explicitly acknowledged its human rights responsibilities. So these are some of the early um, indicators of the potential of this collaborative process, which is both ambitious but realistic and, and seeks to, to go with the grain uh, of what, um, what can be achieved. It will also be integrated into the international reporting to the UN on implementation of international human rights uh, treaty obligations. Uh, it will examine how to give greater effect to international human rights in Scotland's um, constitutional framework, whatever that is uh, after the 2014 referendum. So to include economic, social and cultural rights, for example, uh, that especially in times of austerity, the right to adequate housing, the right to adequate standard of living, to the highest attainable standard of health care. These are the sort of rights that need to be much better integrated into law policy and in particular outcomes uh, for people uh, around uh, Scotland. So a big role for the cross-party group to, to play in the implementation of that. Uh, and it may be um, that that could be uh, something on the agenda of, of the next cross-party group meeting once you've all had a chance to, to properly reflect on, on what's in the action plan and, and to then have an informed discussion about it. Um, I'd like to thank all of those who've, who've taken part in the process um, and I'd like to introduce one of the, the key players in that, um, uh, Tressa Burke from the Glasgow Disability Alliance. And perhaps, Tressa, you'd like to just share with us what SNAP has meant and will mean uh, to you and those who you work with. Thanks, Alan. Can people hear me okay? Yeah. Hope if I, am I the final speaker? That's, no, that's good. I was going to say because that's cruel. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just say a wee bit of background about the organisation I work for. I work for Glasgow Disability Alliance. That's a, a member-led organisation of disabled people 
um, based in Glasgow, and we've got over 2,000 members, all of whom are disabled people. I'm a disabled person myself, and we're connected to and a member of Inclusion Scotland, which Bill here uh, runs, and um, we're part of the disabled people's movement in Scotland. So just to say that that's kind of where we're coming from. One of the things we do is that we work to raise the voices and the experiences of disabled people into services so that services can be better um, accessible, more appropriate, more responsive to disabled people. So we carry the voices and we support disabled people to carry their own voices as well. We use human rights based approaches because as disabled people ourselves, along with the, the bigger movements in Scotland and across the world, we've always located the problems of disability within a human rights context, because disabled people have always uh, or often had their dignity undermined. So we've understood that even before we understood it in a proper legal context. We think that human rights are important to addressing injustice and achieving equality and dignity. Um, and we're, you know, we're so pleased to be part of the SNAP process, and I'll talk a wee bit more about that in just a second, but just to say, launching it in this parliament, which has um, human rights in its DNA, is just fantastic, because we've seen firsthand that the parliament has some innovative approaches to uphold the rights of disabled people in Scotland, both in law and in policy. We've seen rights-based approaches um, in areas like self-directed support, which has got some fantastic references to independent living and human rights in it. And there's a number of other things, I won't mention them all. We know that there are really good challenges, uh, really good intentions, but there are still very much challenges in interpreting, interpreting the good intentions to actual practice on the ground. And there are a lot of gaps. And this is what SAP, SNAP seeks to change. It's a vision of Scotland in which everybody is able to live with human dignity, to build a culture in which dignity and respect is at the heart of everything we do. And it's the country I think we all want to live in people from all areas of life and people from all political parties. So just to maybe say a wee bit about my experience on the Advisory Council, I really feel very proud that Glasgow Disability Alliance was invited to be part of this process. And I have to say, I'm not one of the people who did the majority of the work. The drafting group, I would say, done that along uh, with Duncan and Alan. Um, but I was there at the meetings, taking things back to our Drivers for Change group, getting them to comment on drafts, feeding that back in. And I really feel that the process was so participative in itself, it was actually very empowering. And earlier on today, in, in a conversation, I actually likened it to another piece of work, which was to develop the National Standards for Community Engagement way back um, a number of years ago. And that was also a process that was really participative and involved over 500 people across Scotland. It was very similar to this. Um, but the difference, I think, is that process, you would have expected to be like that because of the nature of what that work was. I wouldn't have expected a Human Rights Commission to know how to do this and to do it so spectacularly well, and I mean that very sincerely. We really hope that SNAP sets out the journey from where we are to where we want to be, from good intentions to good practice, and from assuming things will be fine to ensuring that, we, that they actually are. And we hope it provides a useful framework to make it happen. SNAP is a roadmap, but it's just the start of the journey. And what matters most is what happens next, because there are real and immediate human rights concerns. What we found as disabled people is that austerity and welfare reform are not being addressed with human rights in mind, and disabled people are amongst the primary casualties. I described earlier on today when I was speaking that disabled people describe facing the worst ever crisis due to a perfect storm of cuts to services via service reform, reduced access to justice, welfare reform, increasing community care charges. And one of the things I didn't mention this morning, but it's so obvious to me, is the hostile attitudes and the horrendous experiences of hate crime and bullying and harassment that disabled people are increasingly reporting to us, so much so that we've trained to become a third party reporting centre. Now, that's not something you easily fit into your daily business when it's not your nature of work. So that says something about the, the concern we have about that issue. 
Social care budgets are so stressed that there's barely enough money for people to have life and limb support, never mind fulfilling aspirations such as social participation or working or civic involvement or being able to access learning and support because instead they're deemed no longer disabled and in some cases they need to prove that they're looking for jobs that we actually believe don't exist anyway. Now, not to put a lot of pressure on SNAP here, we know that SNAP's not going to address all these concerns overnight, and today's the start of a process, and we should all be involved in this, working together to address priority human rights concerns and embedding a human rights culture in Scotland for the long term. We're hopeful that SNAP's going to help with some challenges, um, for example, being involved in health and social care integration and making sure that disabled, uh, disabled people's voices are heard. And that's something that we're quite concerned could not happen, but we really believe that SNAP's going to offer us a framework for taking that forward. The approach taken has included working collaboratively across the public sector and the voluntary sector and agreeing the outcomes we want to achieve, a better culture, better lives and a better world. We've worked with others to establish priorities through consensus and building a process that will encourage innovation and improvement. We as disabled people in our organisations have got some learning to share around issues like co-production and um, the implementation of Article 19, which is about independent living. And that's just about disabled people having the choice to stay in their own home with the support they need to live their lives and participate fully in their communities. So that's all that is. Um, we feel that we have examples to reflect and learn from that with the Scottish Government through their independent living programme, with Glasgow City Council, which is my area of work, um, and community planning in Glasgow, where we're trying to implement and develop a human rights um, and independent living strategy. And we've got other examples and experiences of being involved in things like the Poverty Leadership Panel in Glasgow as well. And there's a lot of really fabulous things happening. They're happening quite slowly, but there are you know, really good examples of progress, and there's a lot of learning um, from that work that we can share. People whose rights are affected and those with responsibilities and authority should be around the table together to agree what needs to be done and how. The process should be and has been so far about working together, working differently towards a shared goal in a way that's respectful of all involved and seeking to shift power, building on all strengths to promote equality and rights. It's been based on human rights and has demonstrated the panel principles, resulting, as I said, in a sense of empowerment for those involved. Parliamentarians have a role to play too in thinking through how this parliament can more effectively take human rights into account in the passage of legislation and in the work of its committees. What SNAP gives us all is a transparent and accountable framework for transformative change within which we can consider how we ensure human rights are respected, protected and fulfilled in all areas of our lives. For me, for disabled people in Scotland and for our organisations, it's an opportunity too good to miss and I hope you all agree. I commend SNAP to you and hope you'll all become involved too. Thank you.